Scorched Earth by Jonathan Crary. Uh, this is the second and last part of chapter three, which is also the last chapter of the book. The Swiss zoologist Adolf Portman offered a broader framework in which to consider the color of the iris. Rejecting func functionalist explanations based on natural selection, Portman proposed that the appearance of every living organism serves a fundamental purpose, self-expression or self-projection. Years of research led him to the stunning hypothesis that the living world in its infinite richness of color and form is designed to be seen. Writing in the 1950s when positivist assumptions about the study of nature went mostly unquestioned, Portman sought a holistic understanding of the sensory interconnectedness of an animate earth. At the same time, he was one of a few deploring the spread of a visual illiteracy brought on by reproductive media such as National Geographic and TV wildlife shows and exclusively urban lifestyles resulting in remoteness from a non-human life world. Since then, the estrangement of our senses from the world has been immeasurably heightened by the per per pervasiveness of computer-generated images of all kinds. Now, for example, we can easily access magnified ultra-high resolution images of irises, which reveal countless details unseen in a direct meeting. Yet for most viewers, these become unremarkable curiosities, drained of anything experienced in lived interpersonal proximity. One particular capability of eye tracking is the collection of data on what colors and combinations of colors and graphics are most or least eye-catching. Information that is then deployed in the management of perception and response. Research on color and behavior, especially in relation to advertising, is hardly new, but what has changed is our 24-7 engagement with the chromatic environment of screens and displays. The ubiquity of electroluminescence has crippled our ability or even motivation to see, in any close or sustained way, the colors of physical reality. Habituation to the glare of digital displays has made our perception of color indifferent and insensitive to the delicate evanescence of living environments. For tens of thousands of years, human life was lived around the ceaseless rhythm of day turning into night into day. Every morning was a flowering and recoloring of the world after an interval of sometimes moonlit or starlit darkness. However, the nocturnal suspension of color is not an objective reality. The photoreceptors in our eyes that enable us to see color cannot function in low light, and the rods that enable us to see in near dark darkness are insensitive to colors. Thus, the pulse of this endless coloring and darkening is an experience specific to our body's response to the daily rotation of the earth. This is why twilight has always been a unique part of those passages from day to night. Dusk is an interval that heightens our sensitivity to the transition from direct solar radiance to the indirect and slowly dwindling illumination of the sky. It's a time when the deepening of colors can be felt with all our senses. Color is continuous with our tactile sens sensitivity to inflections in the air, to sounds, odors, and to a bodily awareness that birds, animals, and vegetation are likewise attuned to this daily event. During all the thousands of years of pre-modernity and pre-history, what we think of as color would never have been separable from this interplay of the senses and from the vital presence of other coexisting forms of life. Only in the last several centuries, beginning in the West, has the reduction of color to exclusively optical properties taken place, and the fragmentary notion of a sunset or landscape becomes possible as a detached visual spectacle for a distanced observer. The invention of artificial colors in the mid-19th century had far-reaching consequences. It's no coincidence that the large-scale manufacture of highly profitable synthetic dyes in the 1860s brought into being the chemical conglomerates from IG Farben and BASF to Dow, DuPont, and Sinopec that have been damaging and obliter obliterating life on the planet for the last hundred years. The industrialization of color is historically intertwined with the making of plastics, 
herbicides, pesticides, PCBs, polyvinyl chloride, and innumerable other compounds that have poisoned our water, air, soils, and oceans. Driven by the expansion of commodity production and the rise of mass consumption, the pro proliferation of manufactured color is part of a larger relocation of sensory experience into the needs and values of a capitalist economy. Synthetic color becomes allied with techniques of attraction, solicitation, and persuasion. Writing around 1900, the sociologist George Simmel observed that when nothing is exempt from becoming monetized or exchangeable, we are condemned to a world drained of color, stripped of the fabric woven from all the moments of heightened life and quiet elation that are born most often in mutuality and intimacy. To the extent that money with its colorlessness and, in, and indifferent quality can become a common denominator of all values, it becomes the frightful leveler. It hollows out the core of things, their peculiarities, their specific values, and their uniqueness and incomparability in a way that is beyond repair. Simmel's piercing characterization remains fitting for our own present, where we are enveloped in the algorithmic nullity of electroluminescence. We are rendered incapable of directly apprehending the fragile interconnectedness of all living things. 24-7 engagement with screens has so thoroughly anesthetized us that we've lost the sensory capacity to experience ourselves as part of the animate matrix of earthly life. As David Abram and others have warned, we've lost our bodily understanding of the world and its rhythms and no longer have a kinesthetic immersion in living environments. We may abstractly deplore the millions of lives and species rendered disposable by capitalism or the devastation of ecosystems on which we depend, but we cling to our disembodied online routines and to the illusion that the internet complex is somehow not a primary agent of the catastrophe. Many believe that our main concern should be with the intrusive privacy violating objectives of biometrics. However, the current clamor over surveillance capitalism needs to be made transparent. Its target is not capitalism, but the supposed excesses and violations that have been imposed on a fundamental, fundamentally reformable but indispensable system. It is a deflection of critique that affirms the permanence and necessity of the existing underlying arrangements. The intensifying of our anxiety about online privacy, corporate data mining, and threats like malware and DOS attacks only deepens our investment in the logic of social separation and in the paranoid premises of cybersecurity. By design, there never will be network privacy for individuals, but we are nonetheless asked to believe that legislation to guarantee privacy may someday happen, that current abuses can be curbed, and that we can reclaim the reassuring fiction of our internet that in fact never existed. We are pushed further into identifying ourselves with our data, our, our, search, hi fuck, our search history, our passwords, the demands of secrecy and an anonymization, encryption and firewalls warp every aspect of our online lives and undermine the sustaining of demo democratic or communitarian values. Cybersecurity and the wariness of endless upgrades becomes a normalized part of daily life. One IT security firm promotes its products as follows. The new threatscape we all inhabit requires zero trust. Zero trust security assumes that bad actors already exist, both inside and outside the network. Trust must therefore be entirely removed from the equation. That shit's happy. Facial recognition is one of the core technologies of the global biometrics industry, and much of the critical debate around it has concerned privacy, inaccurate identifications, racialized bias, and its use in social credit ratings. However, in addition to the identification of a specific individual through matching with an archived face print, there are other significant uses of these resources, especially in emotion recognition technology, or what is called 
effective computing. One major company offers software for seamless data collection, synchronization, visualization, and analysis in combination with other sensors and technologies such as eye tracking, galvanic skin response, EEG, facial expression analysis, and much more in one single computer system. One of the aims is to determine the emotional state of someone under observation, often through the categories of happiness, sadness, surprise, anger, fear, disgust, and contempt, and dozens of secondary expressions. Corporations with names like Affectiva, Emotient, and Beyond Verbal are developing forms of facial coding or emotion AI to analyze facial expressions in real time. In the words of one company's promotions, we now have a powerful way to understand consumers' unfiltered responses by measuring moment by moment reactions to digital video and ads. For example, it can identify the ads that generate the best emotional response on repeat viewings or the on screen behaviors of media personalities that draw viewers back. Equally important is the use of these applications in gaming design in order to maximize addictiveness. Again, as I insisted in my discussion of eye tracking, the consequences of effective computing have begun to diminish all of our lives, regardless of whether we have ever been individually subjected to these techniques. They are one aspect of the reductive homogenization and mechanization of emotion, which neoliberal capitalism requires. Analysis of the smile is particularly important for the design of products or content that aims to provoke a pleasurable response. There is software capable of detecting all kinds of smiles, especially to indicate when a, when a minimum smile threshold is triggered by stimuli of various kinds. This computational scrutiny of the face can also interpret micro expressions, such as the flickers of involuntary motor activity that, for example, might conceal the expression of an emotion or simulate an, emo an emotion we do not feel. There are scanners for detecting asymmetric facial expressions, such as slight traces of smirks or grimaces, unlike symmetric smiles, which are deemed to indicate happiness and enjoyment. Asymmetric smiles with lips higher on one side of the face supposedly disclose a negative valence, which might include emotions such as consternation, defiance, or skepticism. At the same time, computer analysis of the smile is an important tool for the design of robots or digital avatars in order to endow them with credible and seemingly genuine expressions. In the words of one robotics company, the goal is to infuse them with emotional intelligence and make them truly social. What was once part of the vital background fabric of everyday life, that is the ways we present ourselves to others, is relocated into numbing and debasing functions. As we expand our interactions with machines as a face, a voice, or both, vacuous models of emotion and expression begin to pervade an immense number of situations. The point is not that we are becoming like machines or behaving inauthentically. Rather, we're on the verge of losing the ability or even the interest in engaging the gaze or voice of another as an object of care or intimate reflection. Historians Jean-Jacques Courtin and Claudine Harache have shown how the face in the West has been a contested site around which different practices of self-presentation have developed. As modern notions of individuality emerged, especially in the 17th century, the face with all its expressive possibilities required self-mastery and control. Because the face could potentially reveal and expose one, it was important to learn ways of rendering it opaque or inscrutable. New social environments demanded the ability to modulate one's expression to conceal real feelings or to simulate false ones. Beginning in court society, individuals learned what facial expressions were appropriate to specific social situations and what was permissible in private, more intimate settings. During this same period, knowledge was produced that offered ways of understanding and deciphering expression. However, for Curtin and Harash, the availability of photo photography and the advent of mass society in the later 19th century changed everything. The ubiquity of photographic images in media of all kinds, the emergence of new regularities and topologies, 
and the anonymity and atomization of modern urban life diminished the relevance of what was derivable from direct encounters. Over a century later, with the ascendance of the neurosciences, social media, and the AI capabilities just surveyed, there has been a foreclosure of individual attentiveness to what social theorist Avery Gordon describes as complex personhood. The billions of images of faces in online advertising and on social media, most of them smiling, make up a limitless, disheartening surface defined by a narrow yet vague attribute of likability. Of course, this is reciprocally related to the vast enterprise of corporate face and voice recognition, a scrutiny primarily undertaken to determine and enhance the attractiveness of services and products. What is most disturbing is not the commodification of sentiment or the ominous scenario of behavior control. Rather, it is the wreckage of social formations in which understanding and experience of others, of the uniqueness and inter... 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 Oh, fuck. Indeterminacies of face and voices were once valued. We are losing the ability to see a face or hear a voice in its temporal depth to apprehend the signs and sounds of experiences gathered over a lifetime. The critic Sigrid Weigel has written about how the deep traces of loss, sorrow, love, perseverance, or resignation in a human face are superfluous, hence illegible to machine emotion analysis. More importantly, these imprints of a life with which we all, mar all are marked are becoming increasingly imperceptible for anyone habituated to amnesic, or quasi-automated online exchanges. Ever since the early 20th century, the face has been a theme of critical and ethical significance. In the context of both the increasing fragmentation of urban life and of World War I with its millions of slaughtered and maimed, the face invited a new valuation and even sanctification, evident in various ways in the writings of George Simmel, Rainer Maria Rilke, Max Picard, Martin Buber, Franz Rosenzweig, and later, after World War II, in the work of Emmanuel Levinas. But within the contested ideological field of the first decades of the 20th century, any defense of the uniqueness of the individual within mass society or reflection on the notion of personhood were often dismissed as bourgeois humanism or anti-modern disillusionment. However, Amid the ongoing incorporations of the face into the functioning of digital surveillance, marketing, and vacuous social media, some of those earlier meditations resonate with continued relevance. There's a long history of the face as image, whether of Christ, of whiteness, of the monarch, or tyrant. By the early 20th century, the despotism of the face had been assimilated into dominant forms of spectacle and celebrity culture. But within this oppressive continuum of face's image, the living face of the suffering, the destitute, or the non-white is consistently erased. For Martin Buber, the face was important as a defining element of a human encounter in which speech, or the withholding of speech, was made possible. At the heart of life, for Buber, was the actuality of a meeting that occasioned dialogue or held forth its possibility. Dialogue was crucial to the building or sustaining of living together as a community. His evolving advocacy of a communitarian socialism came out of his, out of his sustained engagement with the work of Proudhon, Marx, Kropotkin, Landauer, and Lenin, as well as with the experiences of the Paris Commune, workers' cooperatives, and the early uh, kibbutzim. Working and being together required from everyone a level of shared responsibility. But this could only occur meaningfully as a response to what faces one in a living situation. Thus, one was obliged to resist engaging with the face as image or listening to speech out of habit. The glance, Buber says, lives in the space of events. Every living situation has a new face that has never been and never will come. And sorry. Every living situation has a new face that has never been and will never come again. Contrary to some mischaracterizations of Buber's work, there is nothing mystical or blandly warm-hearted about his notion of the meeting. Meetings can occur between strangers or enemies as much as between neighbors, co-workers, or lovers, between two people or within a group. 
The meeting is simply an inescapable precondition for the sustaining of human connectedness. Even violence against the being one truly encounters is better than ghostly solicitude for faceless digits. Dialogue opens up not to some Rousseauian meeting of souls, but to the contingent possibility of living reciprocal relationships in a shattered world. As Buber was to insist, um, sorry, mutuality would always be incomplete, never fully achieved, just as the community of which it was the foundation was always an unfinished and ongoing project. Buber readily acknowledged that we spend most of our lives in the it world of institutions and markets where the desire for gain and the will to power are natural and, in and inevitable forces. But throughout history, the depersonalized it world had been mitigated by communal forms of life in which caring, mutual support and festivity were valued and sustained. Yet technological modernity, he feared, was so encroaching on those spheres that the interhuman is threatened in its very existence. The value of Buber's work lies not in the degree of its orig originality, but in the clarity with which it articulates what is intuitively known or apprehended by many. It has the familiarity and epiphanic force of the commonplace. This is also why Buber continues to be patronized or dismissed by many academic philosophers for whom his accessibility is a disqualification. They compare him unfavorably with Emmanuel Levinas, whose ethical theory is extolled, in part, for its challenging obtruseness, enlightening for Buber, as it has been for other thinkers, was the uh, Heraclitus fragment. The waking have one world in common. Now, with the dispossession and instrumentalization of the face, voice, and gaze, there is a further disabling of the most basic capabilities through which the common can be invoked. Giorgio Agamben, writing in the early 1990s, anticipated this sweeping dispossession as the closing down of the very possibility of dialogue spe or di dialogic speech as violence to the linguistic being of humans. He too cites Heraclitus's One World in Common to preface his account of the effects of global media and information networks. What is being appropriated is the possibility itself of a common good. Writing before the widespread diffusion of internet culture, Agamben, Agamben singles out the debasement of the face as one of the ways in which language is disfigured and emptied of its social efficacy. In an essay that draws on the work of Buber's collaborator, Franz Rosenzweig, Agamben declares, the face is the only location of community. The face's revelation is revelation of language itself. <clears throat> Pointing to how the face is exploited and debased in advertising, pornography, and many other domains, he writes that the face is the object of a global civil war whose battlefield is social life in its entirety. Whose victims are all the peoples of the earth. Now, 25 years since these reflections, there is no limit on the extent to which the gaze, the voice, and the face can be split off from social spaces and inter interpersonal association. They are made into objects of monitoring and, anal and analysis for a variety of purposes and uses, but the overriding goal is the smoother assimilation of humans into machine systems and operations, a goal that requires the narrowing and standardization of our reactions to people, events, and exchanges of many kinds. Now there is an expanding use of voice analysis to identify the emotional mood of a speaker through auditory features of pitch, tone, speed, and volume, making it possible to quantify how positive or negative a speaker feels about a subject under discussion or about their interlocutors. As more platforms become voice powered, human speech is processed into behavioral information and robotic voices are made to simulate emotional interactions with users while being continuously upgraded to seem more likable and trustworthy. Personal assistants create feedback loops in which a machine can modify its performance based on determinations of mood or sentiment. 
In popular culture, there have been many, mostly sanguine or comedic characterizations of human-robot conversations to the point of trivializing the phenomenon. We repeatedly are told that machines are becoming more human, an absurd, fatuous claim because it presupposes a neoliberal, corporatist notion of what human is. Most of the innumerable shadings of how words can be articulated and sequenced become irrelevant in, in uh, machinic transactions, despite the purportedly lifelike modeling of robotic speech. As machine voices become more pervasive, we lose the sensitivity to discriminate between lifeless, simulated sounds and the embodied vocalizations of a human being. The meaningful, the meaningful content of human speech is inseparable from its bodily performance. The rhythm of breathing, the movements of the folds and muscles of the larynx, the actions of mouth and tongue. For thousands of years, one of our primary means of understanding others has been our intuitive sensitivity to what is conveyed by these resonances and vibrations of a living voice. Now, when talking to robots, we involuntarily flatten and diminish the breadth of expressiveness in our own, wor in our own words, and there is a withering of singularity and spontaneity in many of our other verbal interactions. An utterance is now often the equivalent of flicking an, an on-off switch. So what, some will reply, hasn't language always been a praxis, a way of doing things? This retort is either naive or cynical because it ignores the powerful institutional and financial circuitry within which spoken words are now solicited and deployed by data-driven procedures. The expropriation and depletion of speech, of course, is not new. The radio and television era certainly accustomed everyone to the sound of lies uttered by voices emptied of human purposive purposiveness. But this is now occurring on an immense and programmatic scale. The late Icelandic composer Johan Johansson crafted a, word, a work in 2016 with recordings of shortwave radio broadcasts from the Cold War. These were from the so-called numbers stations on which intelligence agencies in the 1960s and 70s transmitted coded messages. In this piece, Song for Europa, we hear the mechanical, flattened voice of a young girl repeating seemingly random sequences of numbers. Over her bleak recit recitation, Johansson sets an elegiac, ascending harmonic pattern played by a string ensemble, highlighting not just the capture and depersonalization of the child's voice, but the larger ways in which modern forms of power injure the most precious and vulnerable elements of human connectedness. The prevalence of such inanimate and repetitive exchanges further disables one's aptitude or patience for the frustrations and inconclusiveness of meeting, speaking, and being with others. For the past 15 years, much of the world has become habituated to monetized forms of communicating that isolate a speaker or sender in controllable one-way circuits. At the same time, the internet has fostered a culture of prying and exposure. Everything deemed worth knowing about someone is quickly searchable and retrievable. Whatever might be learned of another over time through earned mutuality and unconcealedness is of no material value or relevance. We are losing the possibility of listening, of facing with forbearance, a stranger, someone destitute, someone who offers nothing to our, to our self-interest. We are even less able to understand the difficulties of being present to someone or to accept that dialogue may open up not on connectedness or fellowship, but onto the unknowability of others. Corporate designed forms of social media have eliminated the possibility of an ethical relation to otherness and affliction. In numerous ways, we are induced or compelled to follow the routines of digital work and leisure and to align ourselves with their mediocrity and, mind and mindlessness. Like Kafka's land surveyor, we convince ourselves that our goals and aspirations can be achieved through a dutiful and numbing conformity with the precepts and regulations of a system we know to be malign. We acquiesce out of passivity or convenience, and over time we come to have thoughts and gestures that are no longer our own. We live surrounded by what philosopher Adi Ophir 
calls superfluous evils, those many forms of unbearable suffering that could be prevented, but that persist by design or neglect. Given the brutalities and injustices plaguing the earth today, to some it may seem of secondary importance to foreground the ethical consequences of these techniques for scanning the gaze, the face, and the voice. However, if we aren't attentive to how neoliberal imperatives are harming the intimate fabric which upholds the interhuman, we become less and less capable of sustaining or even initiating the larger scale struggles against imperial war, economic terror, racism, sexual violence, and environmental disaster. With a weakened ability to respond to others, there is no abiding sense of mutual accountability and no motivation to abandon the meager compensations of one's digital insularity. One of the most noted and now banalized phenomena of contemporary urban life is the atomized crowd of individuals all seemingly absorbed by the contents of their screens. These all too familiar scenes in any place of assembly amplify the implosion of public space and constitute a ritual demonstration of the refusal of community demanded by neoliberalism. They are a portent of the loss of the encounter, of a life world based on the indispensability of being with others. Yet we are told that this is merely an annoying and inconsequential side effect of the productive workings of our digital age, to which we will become accustomed, or that such behavior will moderate over time. This splintering of a social world is based on the obligatory acting out of busyness, of self-occupation. It's irrelevant what anyone is actually doing, whether looking, working, texting, shopping, surfing, listening, gaming, or whatever. The result is mass acquiescence to an immaterial architecture of separation, sustained by the simulation of self-serving activity and indifference to anything external to that performance. In such circumstances, there is a nihilistic willingness to let the world lapse. It is it is an insularity without the restorative benefits of actual solitude. It is the pseudo privatization of public spaces, but without privacy. Obviously, capitalism has spawned many configurations of social alienation and separateness, as thinkers from George Simmel and Emil Durkheim to Guy Debord and Richard Sennett have shown. But even in the mid 20th century era of the lonely crowd, public space was still latently charged with the unexpected or unforeseen, with possibilities of chance occurrences, meetings or conversations, which are now increasingly closed off. The psychopathology of today's cellu cellularization of public space was anticipated by Eugene Minkowski's clinical research of the 1930s, in which he characterized pervasive forms of mental illness as a loss of vital contact with reality. More explicitly, he saw this condition as a loss of the capacity for sympathy, which is the most natural and most human aspect of our lives. In the undamaged individual, he wrote, sympathy surrounds all our perceptions like a living fringe that allows our responses to life with others to be supple, malleable, and human. The vibrancy of that fringe of that awareness, both sensory and ethical, of the world at the periphery of what are we, whatever we may be doing is jeopardized by daily immersion in self-interested and privatized pursuits. The dwindling of care and attentiveness to others amplifies the one-way discourse and generalized autism that shape most activity online. Clearly, the neutralization of sympathy and the loss of a sense of responsibility reflect the larger disintegration of the moral scaffolding of everyday life. Alongside all of the tools for face, voice, and emotion recognition, our own capacity for recognition of the human be begins to fail. The philosopher Paolo Verno has examined some of the consequences of the singular fact that the human animal is capable of not recognizing another human animal as being one of its own kind. The extreme cases, from cannibalism to the colonial and European genocides, powerfully attest to this permanent possibility. For Verno, this non-recognition is the limit at which the possibility of society begins to break down. The omnipresence of collectively, collectively occupied spaces, marked by indifference to the proximity of others, is inseparable from the scorched earth disaster of the present. 
It becomes a negative attunement to a world that is no longer shared. Public spaces, as Alberto Perez Gomez has argued, have historically been milieus in which an enveloping mood drew a group together, allowing action to be experienced as purposeful and enabling individuals to feel part of a larger whole. However, the mood or the atmospherics of now atomized social spaces is disquieting, palpably toxic, and even more corrosive than is superficially evident. Cumulatively, there is, there is a dissipation of curiosity about otherness or about the wondrous plenitude of non-human life. Experience is reduced to what can be instantly searched online. The Marxist theorist Ernst Lohoff has explored the violent parameters of life in a market-driven reality that dispenses with a society to become composed only of individuals competing to succeed and survive on their own, whatever the cost. The lunacy from which none are spared, having to exist as a self-sufficient subject, translates itself into the crazy impulse to defend this unlivable way of existence by any means necessary, even with a weapon in hand. The individual's subjugation to the market is thus marked by delusions of autonomy and yet grounded in actual powerlessness. The, r the rationalization and full econom economization of social relations creates a greenhouse in which their imminent opposite irrationality, always already charged with violence, thrives. It is remarkable that at a moment of unparalleled danger for the future of the planet, for the very survival of human and animal life, that so many people should voluntarily confine themselves in the desiccated digital closets devised by a handful of soci sociocidal corporations. Pathways to a different world will not be found by internet search engines. Rather, what is needed is exploration and creative receptivity to all the resources and practices developed over the long history of human societies for thousands of years. There are enormous reserves of knowledge and insight from all eras about techniques of subsistence and the fostering of community that need to be recovered and adapted for present needs especially from cultures in the global south and indigenous peoples. Realistic strategies of resistance also require the invention of new ways of living. There must be a radical rethinking of what our needs are, of rediscovering our desires beyond the flood of shallow cravings that are promoted so unrem unremittingly. At present, the main way in which we communicate with others is through what we buy, through the petty symbolic capital we strive to acquire prompted by envy or the need for esteem. It would be a mistake to underestimate the intractability of individual dependence on the social distinction derived from the branded resources of consumption. But there's also reassuring evidence in times of crisis or emergency that attachments to material possessions and social status can quickly dissipate. For those with children, it means abandoning the desperate expectations these now carry to compete with their peers for individual success, and instead providing them with anticipations of a livable future built and shared in common. But these are only the most preliminary tasks, only a necessary preparation for more difficult challenges ahead. Each region or cross-border community will determine its own pathways, but as many now clearly recognize, the most urgent projects will include the expansion of local food production and distribution, the making available of basic of basic health care and paramedical services, the protection of clean water supplies, and the equitable remaking of existing housing stocks. Both visionary innovation and pragmatic ingenuity will be needed for the reorganization of city neighborhoods, for the reclaiming of derelict spaces, for finding new uses for existing tools and materials, and enlarging a barter economy. Also important will be reconceiving the bonds between humans and animals, salvaging what remains of biodiversity and recovering the spirit of festival and arts defined by group participation. Writing in the late 1950s with a different array of antagonisms at stake, Jean-Paul Sartre made the claim that scarcity is the basis for all human history. History is born, he wrote, from an imbalance which disrupts all levels of society. 
The intrinsic violence of organized scarcity produces the unbearable fact of broken reciprocity and of the systematic exploitation of man's humanity for the destruction of the human. At this moment, the mounting scarcity caused by scorched earth capitalism is imperiling uh, the survival of billions of people and other forms of life on our planet. The extreme social disequilibrium, the murderous deprivations and the ravaging of habitats essential for life are the result of what Sartre called the praxis of other human beings. But he insisted that the response to this violence can be common action by groups and communities that have managed to rebuild, even provisionally, the wounded underpinnings of human relations. Isolated individuals can make the discovery that common action is the sole means of reaching the common objective. Although global capitalism is run through with irre irreparable cracks and fissures, it is still held together by individuals clinging to their separateness, their privacy, their freedom from other selves, and their fear of anything communal. The internet complex continues to mass produce these solitary subjectivities to deter cooperative forms of association and to dissolve possibilities for reciprocity and collective responsibility. The threshold of a post-capitalist world is not far off, a few decades at most. But unless there is an active prefiguration of new communities and formations capable of egalitarian self-governance, shared ownership, and caring for their weakest members, post-capitalism will be a new field of barbarism, regional despotisms, and worse, where scarcity will take on unimaginably savage forms. Sartre saw that emerging insurgencies had a unique capacity to break free of subservience to antisocial apparatuses, and to transform passivity and isolation into new forms of solidarity. Revolutionary groups, in responding to a state of emergency, he said, could define their own temporality and determine the speed with which the future comes to it. Now, over half a century later, amid the burning and pillaging of our life world, there is little time left to meet up with a future of new ways of living on Earth and with each other.